And speaking about uh, uh, genetic testing, because it was just, uh, just mentioned, now I'd like to turn to um, the most important players here. And I mean, uh, on one hand, uh, there is pharma industry putting on the market uh, each year new, uh, new therapies. Some of them are very designed at a, um, a very accurate molecular level. On one hand, on the other hand, it's genetic testing. The uh, manufacturers of uh, genetic tests who are coming right now um, on uh, with much more emphasis than in uh, in the past, because in the past everybody was interested in uh, creating uh, some models for clinical research. Uh, for uh, in order to find out more about uh, personalized medicine and genetic testing, I'd like to um, address uh, Colin, who is the medical director of, of uh, Myriad Europe. Uh, how do you see um, actually genetic testing at uh, the level of uh, Central and Eastern Europe and specifically Romania. Uh, why am I am so specific? Because uh, as we found out from, from Professor Smy in UK, this is more or less has been much more common on daily medical practice. But here... Yeah, I'm not sure about it. It's being much more common in the UK. Um, <laughs> Actually, but but I'd like I'd like to take a take a step back. I agree wholeheartedly that um, personalised medicine is not just about genetic testing. There's about other markers. Even <coughs> even 15 years ago, when I started in industry working in the hepatitis area, we looked at viral kinetics as well. And this was a very important marker after four weeks of viral kinetics, whether you had a probability or not to go on and have a, a sustained response. Genetics, clearly the area that, that my company uh, is doing the most research in. But it, again, it's not just oncology. Um, the oncologists have been leaders in terms of identifying genetic markers. But uh, we have research ongoing, uh, not just in oncology, but in autoimmune disease and neuropsychiatry as well. I think there has been a lot of focus at this meeting so far about different treatments and personalizing medicine for treatment and intervening. Um, I'd like to take just a few steps back, and I think personalized medicine can cover a number of areas uh, from identifying who is at risk of a disease and therefore implementing appropriate prevention strategies. I think personalized medicine can go further and give you a, a clearer diagnosis of the disease as well. So is my is my cancer, is it benign or is it malignant? Has it got a chance of killing me or is it actually something I can live quite happily with? Um, I think patients rightly at the moment, they see cancer and it's actually 200 plus different diseases that all have very different natural histories. So another aspect is what's my prognosis? So very similar to a diagnosis as well as what's my treatment? So if I have marker X, Will this therapy be good for me or not? I think particularly uh, focusing actually uh, not just on Romania, but also um, a lot of countries, we're all under cost pressures. And, you know, one of the first things that uh, when I was at medical school, we learned in terms of treatment paradigms was that in many areas, no treatment is an option. No treatment or surgery or medical treatments, and then you'd list those as you are, you're practicing your oral exams. And I think we sometimes forget about that. There are some fantastic treatments, the PARP inhibitors coming through for ovarian cancer are seeing some, some really astounding increases in progression-free survival in ovarian cancer. Um, but for example, many patients with uh, ER positive, uh, estrogen receptor positive, HER2 negative breast cancer, for example, and, and um, I'll give you my experience in terms of our test of end of predict for this is a gene expression marker that actually can identify those patients who will be fine with endocrine therapy alone. So they don't need to have chemotherapy, and that's important for the funding decisions. Um, if we look at other, other examples of that, prostate cancer, if uh, as males, if we live long enough, we will 
develop prostate cancer at some point, but most prostate cancer is not aggressive. And so uh, another gene expression test that we have is, is, is Prolaris, actually, looking at how aggressive is that prostate cancer? Do I really need an operation? We've just done a study across Europe, and that shows that even in the low-risk patients and the intermediate-risk patients, we see something like 70% of patients are planned to have a radical prostatectomy. Now, that's really quite aggressive surgery that really does affect patients' quality of life afterwards. And so a test such as this can decide whether or not you have a, a comfort level in terms of going to active surveillance or watchful waiting, so no aggressive intervention. And I think it isn't always a yes-no decision. Uh, and, you know, patients, uh, lay people, expect there to be a yes or a no from any, any test that they have. It isn't always as clear as that. And so I think patient power, and I'd be interested to see this afternoon's discussion more, patient power and patient choice comes in more. And so it's much more the physician's job to give the patient an informed decision, to give them a choice, to give them the information. For example, with our breast cancer test, we, we, we've done a recent very small sample for, for one of the private medical insurers who, who found it useful and reimbursed now in the UK, for example. And one of the patients came back as high risk and therefore the appropriate therapy would normally be to give some chemotherapy, to give adjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, and actually that patient still subsequently decided that she did not want chemotherapy. But it's allowing an informed choice. And I think that's important going forward. Um, I think just touching on sort of three, three different areas, and you've mentioned uh, about the, the payers, I think there is a whole issue around regulations in diagnostics. We've talked about pharmaceuticals, and we have very clear national and pan-European regulations for drugs. The US, it, it hurts me to say, are a little bit ahead of us in Europe. Uh, in that they have a, a single common regulatory pathway for companion diagnostics, for example, uh, and they approve those companion diagnostics specifically at the time of drug approval. There is no regulatory, single regulatory oversight of diagnostics within Europe, and that has potential to lead to um, variations in quality across Europe. There is no single payment mechanism, and we understand that, but even within countries, and then subsequently down to hospital level, we don't know often where the payment is coming for our test. We have a companion diagnostic, for example, for, for Alaparib, which was approved in January this year. And is it going to come from the drugs budget? Does it come from the oncologist diagnostic budget? Does it come from the pathologist? So the last point in terms of the grey areas and things that we need to consider taking forward for, for Romania is who is the one making the decision to take the test? Is it the physician treating the patient, or is it the pathologist, for example? So they're the challenges ahead of us.